where it is in the top three of what is called this, this kind of trinity of high metabolic rate organs. And uh, it's always, even when we're asleep, its metabolic demands are still remarkably high. So it has a very high energetic need. It, it has a high demand and it needs a lot of energy. And that is uh, actually helping us identify problems that we'd never really seen before, specifically with neurological disorders, not just Alzheimer's disease as maybe the lowest hanging fruit, but there are numerous neurological disorders now that appear to have a common core of a metabolic deficiency. And you, you're accurate uh, in pointing out glucose. Glucose is one of the two fuels that the brain primarily relies on. Um, we live in a culture and a society, the way we eat and live, where we're demanding that the brain only use glucose. And as luck would have it, that's the energy source that the brain is increasingly having a hard time use for various metabolic reasons. It's something we get readily in the diet, but even more, thankfully, we make all that we need. Also, even in the absence of eating any, the liver is kind of the great giver when it comes to nutrients uh, in, in, the, in the body. And if it senses that blood glucose levels are starting to drop, it will simply start making glucose and sharing it with the body. Indeed, it does it so well that the liver is capable of making up for any absence of carbohydrate in the diet. So that's why someone could go on a multi-day fast, not be eating any carbohydrate, and yet their glucose levels stay totally normal. That's because the liver is able to make literally all that we need. While our ability to put glucose into the blood is as good as it ever was, our ability to move it out of the blood is what's affected. And that ultimately means, paradoxically, we have an increase in blood glucose and yet an increasing inability to utilize it. You know, and so it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle, but it is that inability to move glucose from the blood into the cells where it would be used for energy that is, is really uh, appears to be the foundational issue in, in many neurological problems, even Alzheimer's disease. Um, the hippocampus is the little pocket of the brain that's most relevant to memory and learning as we kind of form this conversation on Alzheimer's. Much of the glucose that's coming into the brain to be burned for energy requires the humble hormone insulin. Everyone has heard of insulin and insulin's most famous effect not that I'm saying it's most important because insulin does a lot of very important things, but its most famous effect is what it does to glucose, where insulin will essentially come and knock on a door, including the neurons in the brain, and it will open those doors and allow the glucose to come from the blood into the cell, providing the cell with fuel. Well, as the brain starts to become insulin resistant, now you have insulin politely knocking on the door. Maybe even it's pounding on the door of the cell, but the cell won't open up and allow the glucose in. So you have this kind of bizarre kind of demented version of the rhyme of the ancient mariner, where it's not water everywhere, but glucose, glucose everywhere, but not a drop to drink. That's sort of the cry of the brain, where it literally blood glucose levels may be twice as high as they should be, and yet the brain can't get it because insulin isn't working well enough. That's where the inefficiency comes in. Normally, glucose would be providing it because the person's eating so much glucose. And, and, but as the brain starts to become increasingly insulin resistant, now you start to have this energetic gap where the brain needs this much energy. And because glucose is the only fuel available to it at the moment, although there's another fuel, but it, it, there's this gap. And that right. gap is what starts to create not only the memory learning and deficits like you see in Alzheimer's disease, but even the reduced dopamine production that you see with Parkinson's disease or the epilepsy uh, that you see, uh, the seizures that you see with epilepsy and even migraine headaches. All of these, despite being on their surface, distinct disorders, they all share this known and confirmed what's called brain glucose hypometabolism. In other words, a brain that is burning less glucose than normal. So you literally create more chemical energy when the brain is burning a ketone than it does burning glucose. So yes, it is at least as efficient, if not more efficient. And we, we always say, and I even say this, you just did, we say that ketones are an alternate fuel, but the reality might be that it's the primary fuel. And case in point, if we start to increase the ketones in the blood of, of a person, even though uh, the ketones are much lower than the glucose is. Maybe it's only a quarter as much in the blood. Even still, the brain immediately starts relying on ketones. And as ketones go higher and higher and higher, the brain continues to rely on the ketones more and more as its fuel, where we actually were able to get tissue from human cadaver, from tissue donors, and study the difference in gene expression between those genes that are involved in glucose burning versus ketone burning in people who had died with Alzheimer's disease and with no Alzheimer's disease. And it was the glucose burning genes that were compromised, not the ketone burning genes. And that is so powerful because if a person has an energetic gap, 
Well, then let the brain eat ketones, and ketones can more than fill that energetic gap and, and, and indeed improve cognitive performance. Yes, you can. we can supplement ketones, and I can state that authoritatively because there are, in fact, human studies that have been published that prove this, where you take people with Alzheimer's disease, you give them cognitive tests, you give them a ketone supplement to dramatically increase their ketone levels in their blood, you have them conduct, conduct those or perform those same cognitive tests, and they perform better. So the, the, the evidence is quite strong. Now, you have to take the first step, which is that it's ketone making. And of course, as ketones go up in the blood, cells, virtually every cell in the body will start to use the ketones for energy. So that part is very much true, but it all boils down to insulin. And that kind of allows me to address the other part of your question, where are exogenous or supplemental ketones the same as making your own ketones? The ketone is the same. That molecule is the same, but so much of the benefit of a ketogenic diet isn't necessarily the ketones, although in this context, they're very relevant because it's providing the brain with a fuel, but the primary benefit is lowering the insulin and improving insulin sensitivity. Because remember, at the root of the neurological fall is that the brain starts to become insulin resistant. And so the power of a ketogenic diet, not that I ever intend to advocate it in all sincerity, but I would say Alzheimer's disease is probably one of the situations that would benefit the most from a ketogenic diet, from an explicitly ketogenic diet, one that is keeping the insulin so low due to very low carbohydrate consumption and fa um, fasting that you're not only improving insulin sensitivity in the body, including in the brain, allowing it to use glucose better, but you're also making ketones, which simply, uh, just to demystify ketones in a, in a few words, ketones are simply products of fat burning. When the body is burning fat at a very high rate, which it does when insulin is low, it's essentially burning more fat than it needs to use for energy, and it starts turning some of that burning fat into ketones, and then ketones become are a viable fuel in their own right, especially for the brain. So one-to-one, -one, a ketogenic diet, not that I mean to advocate it, but I will certainly defend it, will have a greater metabolic benefit even to the brain than just supplemental or exogenous ketones, as beneficial as they are. And to your point, for people who are unwilling or unable for whatever reason to adopt a ketogenic diet, which admittedly could be difficult in someone with Alzheimer's disease, right? They may be very obstinate and difficult and just refuse to do this. Well, then knowing that you can rely on an exogenous ketone, despite the considerable expense associated with them is nevertheless a, a bit of uh, an encouraging note. There are case report studies that have been published showing that, yes, in early stage cognitive decline, you can, in fact, reverse it. Um, there was a series of studies published by a scientist named Dale Bredesen, and he, he has found this. Again, they're not clinically controlled studies. They're case reports, which is just to say you notice what's happening in the patients. But he's very explicit in noting the cognitive improvements, emphasis on improvements, not just the slowing the decay or even stopping it, but actually reversing it um, by, by encouraging the increase of ketones through fasting and low carbohydrate diets, uh, as well as the consumption, not of, he didn't publish a paper on exogenous ketones as a supplement, but rather including medium chain triglycerides in the diet, like coconut oil explicitly. Coconut oil is enriched with a type of fat that is burned at a much, much higher rate than normal fats, like from meat or dairy or, or vegetable oils. Um, these are burned at much higher rates and are, and are thus um, more capable of increasing ketones in the blood uh, quite uh, fairly rapidly. So there are two primary families of ketone supplements that are available. One and the older one and the cheaper one, uh, older meaning it's been on the market for much, much longer, is what's called ketone salts. And then the newer uh, one, the new kid on the block, much more expensive, but significantly more effective, is a, a line of a, a brand or type rather of ketone called a ketone ester. Um, so the former, the ketone salts are very affordable. They don't increase your ketones as much and they come with the consequence or, or consideration that they have very high levels of well, salt, if you will, these, these molecules like sodium and potassium and magnesium, because you're getting so much calcium and magnesium and potassium that the body just starts excreting it. Yes, in the urine, hopefully not increasing kidney stones, but even in the saliva, making there a noticeable a mineral deposit on the teeth. And then the ketone esters are, have none of those consequences. They're just much more expensive. Is insulin resistance of the brain. The more accurate term would be you have type 2 diabetes and now it's affecting your brain, or even more accurate, you have insulin resistance of your brain. And that is not allowing the brain to get as much glucose as it would normally be taking in. You have high insulin and it's not working well. And so those are both, they each represent different points of attack. 
where we have interventions where we try to help the insulin work better, like exercise. And we have interventions where we're trying to lower the insulin, like fasting and low carbohydrate diets. So we can address both of this on either side. So metformin is a drug that I actually give maybe the highest grade to. When it comes to drugs that will improve insulin sensitivity, I put metformin at the top in part because it does work. It does improve insulin sensitivity. Um, and at the same time, it has relatively modest side effects. Every drug has side effects. Metformin, in my view, are more than outweighed by the benefits. And the side effects are generally quite mild, which is why I say that. Um, now, uh, there is, uh, because in metformin does improve insulin sensitivity, I think it would be warranted in someone who doesn't have obvious signs of type 2 diabetes, but does have obvious signs of cognitive decline or early stage Alzheimer's. I think that would be in anyone's interest in asking. It's also a very cheap drug, um, which I'm always an advocate of. It's off patent. Uh, but using metformin uh, as an effort, as an anti-aging drug, uh, I don't think is warranted in part because of how metformin acts on muscle where we know that in people who take metformin, they literally can't exercise as well. Their aerobic capacity is significantly diminished because the metformin can um, alter, or even dare I say, uh, hurt metabolic function in skeletal muscles. So there's a consideration. And of course, there's no evidence in humans to show that it promotes longevity whatsoever. That's just all speculation. While I don't want to um, just say, uh, make a blanket encouragement for a ketogenic diet, what I would say is I think it is in everyone's best interest that at least for some chunks of hours in a week, that they make sure they have ketones in their blood. In other words, that they're in a state of ketosis. And the easiest way to do that is fasting. Even if someone just can do one 24 hour fast a week, a food fast, they could drink water or other things that won't spike insulin, like you know, coffee or tea, you know, unsweetened, then, then you can ensure that your insulin is coming down and that you can have some ketones. That'll help your body be a little more insulin sensitive, keeping insulin sensitivity working well as insulin goes low, and you're, you're fueling the brain with ketones. So uh, very, very worthwhile to ensure that at least some part of the week is spent in ketosis. And again, the easiest way is fasting, not only a 24-hour fast, but perhaps choosing three or so days a week where you fast through breakfast. You've eaten a good sensible dinner at say six or seven, and you've stopped eating then. And then by, by the time you eat lunch the next day, you'll be in a mild state of ketosis, almost certainly, and it won't be too uncomfortable. So there's no evidence to suggest that having the brain switch between ketones and glucose is, is somehow more beneficial. There's no evidence on that where it's just unrealistic for the majority of us to say, okay, I'm in ketosis and I'm never going out of it. It's rather, let's just be smart with our carbohydrates. Um, we're avoiding the most processed of them for the most part of the day. Uh, and, and we're making sure we have these periods of time where we are keeping insulin low, either through low carb um, or even faster through fasting. We're finding that... Uh, Ketones are increasing energy production, or rather maintaining high energy production in older animals, and it's increasing their curiosity and their exploratory behaviors. So these are, these are brains that aren't satisfied just sitting there. They want to be learning and exploring, and we hope to publish this by the end of the year. The, the animals are moving more, they're exploring more, and, and appearing to um, remember more. It's garbage, though, Deborah. Why? It's garbage. Uh, it really, uh, that's the theory that has fallen apart. Yeah. It just continues to fall apart where we have um, uh, post-mortem data on humans finding that humans will die with Alzheimer's disease or without Alzheimer's disease. And there's no predictive power of who had plaques or who didn't. You'd think if plaques matter, then everyone who died with confirmed Alzheimer's disease would have plaques in their brain. And those who didn't have any evidence of Alzheimer's would have no plaques. And that's just not true. In fact, a very interesting thing happened last year where the FDA had, um, was going through the approval process for uh, an Alzheimer's drug. I wouldn't be surprised if some people saw these headlines. It, was, it made waves. Basically, this drug was approved by the FDA despite the special panel overwhelmingly voting against its use. The reason the panel voted against it is because it showed no powerful efficacy, certainly none worth the cost. And you think if this were working, it'd be worth any cost. And so the more, we, and th that just falls in the same line of a number of drugs that are these anti-plaque drugs and they just don't work. Um, that, that's really, I think, been the primary reason that the energetic view of Alzheimer's disease, disease has become so popular because it has so much more substantial data to support it. Uh, however, not a lot of drugs necessarily, which is why maybe it will never be totally mainstream. Something's only mainstream when there's an expensive drug to go along with it. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I can't answer that definitively just because there's no data that has kind of quantified and measured this effect. If a person, uh, if they're taking a ketone ester, then usually one shot, and I think that's going to be around, uh, maybe it's around 50 milliliters, 
um, that's generally going to increase their ketones probably 50 to 100 milliliters. So like a little shot glass size, 50 mils of a ketone ester will get the person to a very strong state of ketosis, about two or three millimolar, which would normally take about uh, 36 hours or so of fasting to get to that point. A ketone salt amount will maybe get you to, honest to goodness, a tenth of that, maybe about 0.3 millimolar, which, which uh, you could argue is not enough, although that's not been quantified, but the difference between ketone ester and ketone salt is very, very clear. There's no question that ketone ester is significantly more effective, but again, for most people, it's unfortunately cost prohibitive. It's just very expensive to make. What's interesting about traumatic, traumatic brain injury, in fact, I think there is evidence, um, at least in rodents, to show that ketones do enhance recovery from traumatic brain injury. Uh, in, in fact, I'm quite confident even that to a degree that is used even clinically nowadays, where someone under, uh, experiences traumatic brain injury, they're given a solution of lactate and ketones, both of which provide a fuel for the brain and enhance um, the recovery. Part of what has happened is that there's a damage to an enzyme that mediates glucose burning. Um, this enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase gets compromised oddly and through mechanisms I don't know, but it has been measured and it is lower and with TBI. And so there might be a direct attack on the ability of the brain to use glucose. And then essentially any other fuel would then become therapeutic, whether it is ketones or I hate to bring in a new character, but even lactate is a fuel for the brain. That's the kind of dreaded um, molecule that's been very um, erroneously vilified, where people will say, oh, I have muscle soreness. That's all this lactic acid. Humans don't ever have lactic acid. It's just a molecule called lactate, which isn't contributing to acidity whatsoever. And second, it has nothing to do with muscle soreness. Lactate doesn't make a muscle feel sore, but lactate is something that is made from a working muscle. And then the liver can take in that lactate and turn it back into glucose through this incredible process of, you know, recycling biochemistry and to give it back to the muscle to use the glucose. But at the same time, tissues like the brain actually can just pull in the lactate and literally burn it as a fuel like it would ketones or glucose, albeit in much more modest amounts. So we don't call lactate a primary brain fuel. That's glucose and ketones, but it's certainly, if you will, a tertiary brain fuel. In fact, I should say always reliable. It's just whether or not they've manifested. But every time you see them, it's essentially proof positive of insulin resistance. And those are skin problems that you can see. And there are two of them. <clears throat> One of them is acanthosis nigricans, which is where the person will have large, rough sections of like crinkled, almost tissue paper skin. And it'll happen around skin folds, very commonly around the neck. Most people have some kind of modest degree of a skin fold, even if you're lean. It can happen around the neck and it can happen around the armpits. So again, it's kind of tissue paper crinkled um, uh, type skin. In those same areas, a person can start to have um, skin tags. And these are little stalks of skin, not like a big round mole, but almost like a little kind of projection, like a little mushroom of skin, albeit quite small. And I bet everyone already knows what I'm talking about. These are like little mushrooms of skin that'll pop up in these same areas. And, and that, again, those are skin tags. Once again, it, almost proof positive. It's almost a sure thing that if someone has those, they have insulin resistance. In both instances, it's a result of the elevated insulin. Remember, insulin resistance is insulin isn't working the same way that it used to, but also insulin levels are much higher. In each instance, insulin is overstimulating some of the skin cells. In one hand, it's stimulating the melanocytes to produce more melanin to result in a darker pigment in those areas. And then second, it's stimulating the growth of the keratinocytes, kind of one of the, one of the many types of cells in the skin, resulting in that kind of um, column-like growth. I have three kids, 14, 11, and 8. So I feel the pain here. I try to not present any food as illegal or off limits. I don't want my kids to have that kind of view so that when they someday leave the home, they say, oh, to hell with dad, I'm going crazy now. Yeah. Um, I don't want them to think that. And so I have tried to have just very casual conversations where I say, okay, you want a little pack of gummies? Have you had any protein lately? And that's kind of how I say, that's how I'll frame it. It's like, yeah, that's fine. You want to have an indulgence, not, but we also don't keep junk food around the house. It's very, right. very uncommon. But we will have some things, and I don't mind having those as, as treats for the kids. I really don't. Right. I'm glad I could have candy when I was a kid, and I just am glad I didn't ever have too much of it. And so I want to just generally create the same situation for my kids. But I will say, have you had any protein lately? You want to have that? Um, can you have a beef stick? What about a hard-boiled egg? Or, you know, and all my kids like different things. You know, each of them, I swear, like something different just so that they can say they don't like what any of the others like. Right. You know, where my one daughter will like cheese. She'll have a cheese stick. Um, my other daughter will like a beef stick. My other son likes cottage cheese. And so whatever it may be, I will just say, can you get some protein? And it, it, these proteins always come with fat. And I want my kids and my wife and I to always be eating real natural fats that always come with proteins. Don't be afraid of fat, but let the fat come with the protein the way nature intended it, if you will. So that's my view on indulgences as a family, right. certainly with kids. I want them to be able to indulge 
um, from time to time, but I don't have a lot of opportunities in the house. We don't keep candy in the house, right. relatively few opportunities for that, but we have it. It's just always preceded by, hey, can you eat some protein first? Just so they're appreciating what is real food and what is not. So there was a paper just published actually that was a, pros it was literally just published like a week ago in, in the Journal of Frontiers in Nutrition. So a very, very well-respected journal. And it, it was a prospective study that to the best of our ability, scrutinized dietary habits in the United States from 1800. And the lead author has the last name Lee, L-E-E. -E. So again, that was United States Dietary Trends Since 1800. If someone goes to scholar.google.com and types that in, it'll probably be the first hit. What they found is that the consumption of saturated fats is actually inversely associated with the onset of chronic diseases. And to say that another way, as we've been experiencing diabetes and heart disease and Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, we've over the same time span have been eating less and less and less saturated fat. Well, that's pretty difficult to reconcile with the prevailing theory, which is, I would say the lazy one, that saturated fat is causing all of these diseases. It is simply verifiably false. There are even clinical studies that have looked at um, the explicit intervention of adding more saturated fats into diets versus more um, seed oil fats. And the saturated fats appear to be um, not only not harmful, but maybe even beneficial. So, yeah, so I don't believe there's any evidence to suggest the microbiome will enhance ketogenesis. Um, and uh, no, uh, the microbiome will not secrete ketones. However, they do secrete short chain fatty acids. Um, and and uh, like um, butyrate uh, in particular, or, or propanoic acid. So these are the, what's called short chain fats. They're very, very short, kind of like a ketone, although a ketone's not technically a fat, if not technically a fatty acid. Um, but it will make these short chain fats that can get into the blood and kind of act like ketones do, frankly. So that th there's a, a little bit of there while they're, again, not making ketones, but making short chain fats, which are almost analogous to a ketone. Yeah, I, I'm moderately active on social media, um, and particularly Instagram. I try to put out one or two videos a week, and they're always just about a minute or two, purely about metabolic health. And I also have a blog, and people can find that at gethealthhlth.com.